السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته معكم أحلام العمري من الإدارة العامة لمكافحة عدوى المنشآت الصحية. Today we will have a brief session about the main infection prevention and control measures required for encountering the Ebola virus disease. In this workshop, we'll give you an introduction about the Ebola virus disease, an overview of all aspects related to the Ebola virus disease, and we will cover the main infection prevention and control measures required for encountering and managing the Ebola virus disease cases. So uh, first of all, um, I request from all of you that do not be panic uh, about the topic and the title of this session. Uh, instead, we have to uh, prepare ourselves by improving our knowledge and increasing our awareness in regard of the Ebola virus disease. That's because it's the, the main threat or alert that is uh, imposing a risk uh, in the healthcare uh, sectors these days at a global level. But inshallah, we will not encounter it in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, but we have to update our knowledge based on the available evidence and references in regard of the Ebola virus disease. And we have um, to put in our mind and consideration that if we need to beat our enemy, you need to know about your enemy. So let's explore together. Ebola and Marburg are both viruses that belong to the Filoviridae viral family. And they both can cause hemorrhagic fever that is characterized by extensive bleeding, multi-organ failure, and in most cases to, uh, to death eventually. And the case fatality rate for both viruses are high and can reach up to 65% in Ebola and 88% in Marburg disease. And in the, uh, the downlisted uh, link, we can explore further to the taxonomy of the Ebola virus disease. If we need to explore further the classification of the uh, Ebola virus uh, uh, family, so uh, we can use this link uh, that uh, the website of the International Committee of Taxonomy Virus of Viruses, and we can uh, search here by putting the, the name of the virus that we are want to looking about the classification and the family of this virus. So we are putting here or typing the Ebola virus and then search. You will find out that this virus is belong to the Filoviridae uh, family. And after that, you can click to them Filoviridae and find out all the strains and viruses who are uh, belonging to this family. Let's go back and, and uh, discover the history of Ebola virus uh, disease. The Ebola virus was first discovered in the summer of 1976 um, as a mysterious epidemic suddenly struck two Central African towns, killing the majority of victims. Uh, at that time, the medical researchers suspected the deadly Marburg virus to be the, the cause or leading cause of the epidemic at that time. But with what they saw in the microscope images was totally, entirely new pathogen, different than the Marburg, and which would be named after that nearby um, uh, uh, as an Ebola virus uh, because it was uh, in the location nearby to the Ebola River. So the like the yellow fever or dengue, the disease caused by the Ebola virus is a severe type of hemorrhagic fever. And from that time, the Ebola virus disease was the leading cause to a frequent outbreak in several African countries. In 2014, the Ebola virus disease outbreak was the largest outbreak in the history, according to the evidence and research. And the total number of the probable and confirmed cases at that time was around 28,652. And the total number of the confirmed lab results was 15,261. And finally, the total number of deaths was 11,325. So let's have a glance and, um, and a look to the current situation of the Ebola virus disease uh, outbreak. So an outbreak of Ebola virus disease was declared by the Uganda's health authorities on 20 September or 2022, after a case of Sudan Ebola virus was confirmed in the Mumbindi district in the central region of Africa. Uh, and based on the CDC, um, uh, the latest reported cases or the statistic of them. Instant cases uh, till 9th of October was 
48 Ebola virus disease confirmed cases in five districts. And the districts were as the following, Mubindi, 40 cases, Kigawa, three cases, Kasanda, three cases, Kagadi, one case, and Bunigambo, one case. With a four new Ebola virus confirmed cases, all from Mubindi district. So the main uh, impacted area was in the Mubindi district. There are 37 deaths, uh, 17 Ebola virus confirmed, 20 probable, and 14 recoveries. Uh, 10 healthcare workers' infections have been reported with four deaths, unfortunately, and 1,110 cumulative contact listed, of which 657 are under active follow-up with a follow-up rate of 95% in the last 24 hours. So this is the, the, the main overview of the current situation of um, the Ebola virus disease outbreak. So let's have a look in the map uh, about the Ebola virus outbreak in 20, uh, 22nd in Uganda. And it was in the impacted area of the western and central uh, district of Uganda as the following. So what is Ebola virus disease? Ebola virus disease caused by an infection with a group of viruses or strain within the genus Ebola virus. And as we explained in the first slides about the taxonomy of the virus, we can found that the Ebola have, um, have consist of six strains that, uh, that uh, described in this or listed in this uh, slide. The first one, the Zaire strain, it is the main uh, cause uh, uh, of the um, outbreak in 2014, and the current outbreak is caused by the Sudan strain, the Thai forest um, strain, the Bonte Bocchio strain, and also Riston strain and Bombali strain. And we have to ask ourselves, are all these genus Ebola virus or strain causing a disease? Actually, the first four are causing a disease among uh, human beings, but the Riston virus is causing the illness only among the animals, and the Bombali virus, till date, uh, we don't have a clear um, uh, data uh, uh, based on the expert viewpoint. They don't know till date if it's caused disease in either animals or people. So till date, they don't have any clear data if this strain causing any infection among animals or human. So what is the host or reservoir of Ebola virus? So when we are seeing the fruit bats um, in the uh, bush or in the forest, we think that it's a cute, fuzzy animal that we have to take a photo with. But actually, it's a nasty, a koala uh, animal that we have to consider when we are talking about the Ebola virus disease. So it's thought that the fruit bats are natural Ebola virus hosts. Ebola is introduced into the human population through close contact with the blood secretion organs or other bodily fluid or inf of infected animals. So it is a zoonotic um, uh, source of infection from, from animal to human, uh, such as a fruit bats, chimpanzee, gorillas, monkeys, forest, antelope, found ill or dead in the rainforest. When we are defining the, the cases of the Ebola virus as a clinician, we have to put in our consideration that we have two um, uh, definitions, suspected cases and confirmed cases. And when we are talking about or identifying or recognizing the suspected cases, we have to consider both criteria of clinical and epidemiological criteria. So the suspected case is an illness in a person who has both consistent symptoms and risk factors, so both clinical criteria and epidemiological criteria. The clinical criteria, which includes a fever of greater than 38.6 degrees centigrade, and additional symptoms such as fever headache, muscle pain, vomiting, diarrhea, abdominal pain, or unexplained hemorrhage. Like gingival, um, it's the, the uh, bleeding of the um, gum, nasal, cutaneous, like bruises or ecchymosis on the skin, gastrointestinal and rectal bleeding, such as in gross or occult blood. The epidemiological risk factor that linked to the cri clinical criteria must be considered when you are identifying or recognizing the suspected cases of Ebola virus cases. So the epidemiological risk factors are supposed to be within 21 days before the onset of symptoms, such as if there any history of contact with blood or other bodily fluid of a patient known to have or suspected to have Ebola virus disease or Marburg, or if they have any residence in or travel to an area where the Ebola virus disease is currently happening. Marburg transmission is active, 
or a direct handling of a dead or alive fruit bats, monkeys, chimpanzees, gorilla, and forest mammals. But when we have the confirmed case, that means we have uh, a positive laboratory confirmed diagnostic evidence of Ebola virus. So the confirmed case is um, a suspected case with a laboratory confirmation diagnostic evidence of Ebola or Marburg virus infection. The incubation period of the Ebola virus disease is range from 2 to 21 days. I found out this um, uh, application that is uh, posted in the CDC website. It's about the Ebola exposure uh, calculator, and you can have access um, or downloading this application through the Google Play or iTunes in your devices. Uh, the application actually, it, it's made when a person with the Ebola was exposed uh, from the first place to the virus. So um, uh, this application is developed or initiated by the CDC in co collaboration with them, uh, John Hopkins Applied uh, Physics Laboratory Researcher to design the app for the field staff with variable levels of education of Ebola. So we have two types or modes of transmission of the Ebola virus disease. Primary transmission and secondary transmission. And we are already earlier explained that the main uh, source of infection, it was uh, the host or reservoir uh, from the fruit bats. So it's the primary transmission from the animal to human. So humans are mostly infected by handling dead or living in infected animals with bats. So uh, most of cases are recorded in those who spend significant time in caves containing bats or by eating, consuming um, poached meats or through hunting um, activities. So it's the behaviors of the human um, that lead to exposing them to the virus from the animal. The secondary transmission of the Ebola virus disease can be through uh, different uh, approaches or different sources. So transmission through sexual contact has been documented in Ebola and male survivors are um, recommended uh, by the uh, evidence to practice a safe sex for at least 12 months after clinical recovery, according to WHO, unless they have a semen that tested negative on two separate occasions. Also, the direct contact with the blood secretions, organs, or other bodily fluid of infected persons lead to transmission of the infection from the infected to, uh, to another uh, case or another clean case. Direct contact with the surfaces and material, example, bedding, clothing, contaminating, uh, contaminated with bodily fluids such as blood, feces, or vomit from a person sick with Marburg virus or Ebola virus disease or the body of a person who died from the infection. So it can be exposed um, uh, to uh, any community uh, members or to, uh, to the healthcare workers, our frontline healthcare workers, who are providing a direct care to the Ebola virus uh, cases. And till date, we don't have any evidence that the Ebola or Marburg viruses can be spread uh, via uh, insect bites. And the healthcare workers who provide the care to the infected patients are at the high risk of transmission if they are not properly or appropriately implementing the infection control measures. So the science symptoms of the Ebola viruses may appear any time from uh, the incubation period from 2 to 21 days after the contact with the virus, with average of 8 to 10 days. And we have a three phases that really we have to consider and predict it or expect it when we are dealing with the cases of Ebola virus disease. General phase from the first day to the fifth day, early organ phase from the day number six to 13, and the late organ phase from the day 14 to the day 21st uh, after the exposure to the virus. So the general uh, signs and symptoms in the general phase uh, from the day first to the day number five, the, the, the patients here complaining of fever, subjective or recorded more than 38 degrees centigrade, severe headaches, severe malaise, muscle aches and veins, chills, severe watery diarrhea, abdominal pain and cramping, nausea and vomiting, and rash. And the whole face here or the situation described as a ghost-like drawn features, deep set eyes, expressionless face, and extreme lethargic. In the second uh, phase, it's the early organ phase from day number six to day number 13. So the, the patients here complaining of fever that completed or sustained, bloody diarrhea or melina, hematoemesis, bitechiae, ecchymosis, mucosal hemorrhage, 
visceral hemorrhage, conjunctival injection, edema, and finally, hepatia and depression. And the whole face or situation here described as a bleeding face. And actually, our patients are not dying from the virus itself, but it's, it's, the, uh, it's instead that the mounting cell that triggered the immune system overload known as a cytokine storm, which is the explosion of the immune responses that damage blood vessels and causing both internal and external bleeding. So the late organ phase from the day 14 to 21st, the patients here complaining of fever sustained, dementia, coma, convulsion, diffuse coagulopathy, metabolic disturbance, and we all know that the metabolic dis disturbance occurred as a result of the internal and external bleeding. Shock and psychosis. And the whole phase here described as the CNS involvement. So uh, we have to provide um, uh, accurate and appropriate management to our patients to avoid the late phase of the organ involvement. Uh, by providing the intravenous um, uh, fluid infusion, uh, plasma transfusion, uh, providing uh, and uh, maintain the stability of the hemodynamic stability of our patients to avoid the negative consequences. So do we have any vaccine for Ebola virus disease? Actually, we have. And uh, you can find that in the CDC, they are posted only one type of, of vaccine, but in WHO, they posted or recommended two types of vaccine. The Ebola vaccine uh, was uh, discovered or, or initiated first on December 19, 2019, by the Advisory Committee of, um, on Immunization Practices, ACIP, recommended the pre-exposure prophylaxis vaccination with the vaccine called uh, Ervebo. And this is the first FDA-approved vaccine for Ebola. And it can be administered for any adults above or equal 18 years of age. And we have here um, eligible uh, target group or population who are at potential occupational risk of exposure to Zaire Ebola virus. And this recommendations include the adults who are particularly under a specific um, categories. So the targeted group for the Ebola virus vaccine is supposed to be for any person responding or planning to respond to an outbreak of Ebola virus disease anywhere. The, uh, the laboratory healthcare workers who are working at the biosafety level four facilities that work with the uh, live Ebola virus in the United States or healthcare personnel working uh, at the federally designated Ebola treatment centers. And we bought here the United States because till date, um, alhamdulillah, we don't have any need or requirement for administering or any vaccine regarding the Ebola virus. So the second vaccine that recommended in, the, in May 2020 by the European Medicine Agency recommended um, a new vaccine that provided in two series or two doses. The first one called Zabdino and the second one called uh, Mabiva. So the vaccine is delivered in two doses. Uh, the first one, um, uh, Zabdino, and the second one is supposed to be given uh, approximately eight weeks later as, as a second dose. And uh, it's provided for any individual uh, one year and above uh, of age. And uh, the prophylactic, and this prophylactic two doses regimen is therefore not suitable or not recommended to provide it for any uh, population who are um, uh, experiencing an extensive outbreak response uh, because it can be as um, a second uh, uh, prophylactic, but it's not the first choice of prophylactic when we have immediate um, action for any outbreak. So now my colleague um, Adel Anizi will give you um, a, a brief session about the main infection prevention and control measures and interventions required when we are encountering or dealing with the Ebola virus cases. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you, Sister Ahlam. Inshallah, we'll start talk about the infection prevention and control measures. We will start talking about the patient placement and isolation. First, the suspected or confirmed case should be under contact and droplet precaution. This is additional to the standard precaution. That means the patient, he should be under standard contact and droplet precaution. Airport precaution should be taken in case of air solo generation procedure. That means if the patient who's suspected or confirmed case and he have air solo generation procedure, at that time, patient should be under an airborne precaution. Uh, suspected and confirmed case should be 
isolated in single room with designated toilet and hand washing facility. Patient, he should be in single room, he should be isolated in single room, and this room, it should be occupied with the toilet and hand washing facility. Most of the equipment for the routine care should be stored inside the room. All the routine care equipment for the patient, it should be kept inside patient room and also complete restriction for entry to the room and only those who are designated to care for the patient are allowed inside. You need to uh, control the entering to the room only allowed for the person who is giving care for the patient, example doctors, nurse, and any healthcare worker who will give care for the patient. Also, you need to control or you need to absorb who is entering the room. You should uh, or you should have a logbook. You should record all names for the healthcare worker who they will be entering to the patient room. Now we will talk about the personal protective uh, equipment. Due to the nature of the transmission of the Ebola and the Marburg viruses, it's important to appropriately choose the personal protective equipment to protect the skin and mucous membrane. We will talk, inshallah, about the personal protective equipment, what you need from the personal protective equipment, how's the steps for the donning and for the doffing. Uh, number one, single use disposable fluid resistant gown that should be extended to at least mid cup or single use disposable fluid resistant cover oils. You have the choice to if you want to use the gown or the cover oils, but also all of this uh, uh, personal protective equipment, it should be single use and disposable and also it should be fluid resistant. Uh, here we want to mention if you are using the gowns, it should be used in addition to head covers. That means the head cover you should use it if you are wearing the gown. And also a single use plastic abor can be used when patient experiencing vomiting or diarrhea. If the patient he have diarrhea or vomiting, you can also use or add the single use of plastic abor. Number two, full face shield. You should be use the face shield and this face shield it should be cover all the face and also it should be single use and we are using the face shield to provide protection to the face and the eye against splashes and body fluid. Number three mask or respiratory protection you should use or single use of medical mask could be used to protect against respiratory droplets. As we mentioned before the patient confirmed or suspected is under standard contact and droplet precaution because that you need to use the surgical mask also but in additional or if there is any air solar generation procedure you need to upgrade to higher respiratory protection as uh, N95 mask or the uh, PAPA if you remember before we're talking about the patient he is if he have any air solar generation procedure he need to be under the airborne precaution and that's mean we need to change from the surgical mask and we will use the N95 or PAPA. Number four, single use gloves. With extinct cuff, two pairs of gloves should be worn and at minimum the outer gloves should be have extinct cuff to cover the cuff of the gown or the cover all. That's mean you need to use various double pair of gloves it should be double bare and also all of this gloves it should be with extent uh, cuff but it cannot be at least the outer gloves it's uh, a minimum to be with extent uh, uh, cuff we are using this extent cuff uh, outer gloves because or to cover the cuffs of the gown and cover alls number five also the rubber boot you should use uh, the rubber boot if it is available and if it is not the shoes should be completely sealed and non-slippery Inspection and body system, it's advisable that the donning and doffing is done in presence of another provider or healthcare worker to help uh, in uh, inspect or confirm proper donning and doffing and to help in the process as well. That's mean if you have inspection uh, uh, provider, he will be inspect and confirm the donning and doffing also. He will be uh, uh, help if you need any help in the uh, process of the uh, donning of the personal protective uh, uh, equipment. And also the inspection, is it is important 
when donning and doffing to check the PPE that they are free from defects such as a hold, a cut, and also the size of personal protective uh, equipment and the quality of the personal protective equipment. Now we will talk about the steps of the donning for the personal protective equipment. It has nine steps. Number one, remove uh, the personal pylon, such as the watch, jewelry, and ring. You need to remove it. After that, number two, medical scrub should be worn under the cover or, or the gown. It's not allowed for the healthcare worker who will give care for the patient, confirmed or suspect, to wear top or to wear the uh, uh, street cloth. You need to wear the medical scrub. Number three, rubber coats should be done and avoid regular footwear. You need to remove your shoes and uh, wearing the rubber boots. Do not wear the rubber boot above or over the uh, uh, footwear. Number four, done cover all and zip it all the way up and ensure the hood is on the outside. You need to show that you completely close the cover all and also you should be sure that the hood it is outside not inside. It should be outside not when you are wearing it will be in the or between the scrub and uh, the cover all. It should be outside. And also, as we mentioned before, a plastic, a bone can be used as well. If you are expect or the patient, he have history of vomit and the area, you can use the a plastic, a bone. And also, number five, an impermeable fluid resistant gown can be used instead of cover all. As we mentioned before, you have a choice to can, you want to use the gown or you want to use the cover all, but you should be uh, uh, remember that if you are using the gown, you should be use the uh, uh, head cover. Number six, put on the medical mask followed by face shield or eye protection. You will put the surgical mask. After that, you will put the face shield or the eye protection. Number seven, pull the cover all hood to cover the head and a surgical cap can be worn as well. Number eight, put on the first pair of gloves and you sure it is under the cuff of the cover all or the gown. The first pair, it should be under the cuff or the, uh, of the cover all or the gown. Number nine, put on the outer pair of long gloves that covers the cuff of the cover all or the gown. Now we will talk about the steps of doffing personal protective equipment. Number one, you need to inspect the personal protective equipment and uh, you need to disinfect the outer gloves with approved Ministry of Health disinfectant. Number two, you need to remove the outer gloves and ensure not to contaminate the surface of the inner gloves. And you need also to disinfect the inner gloves. Number three, uh, you need to lower the hood with back rolling motion and ensure not to touch the face and you need also again to disinfect the inner gloves. Number four, tilt the head back a little to reach the zipper and fully unzip the uh, uh, suede and disinfect the inner gloves. After that, roll down the cover all while turning inside outside with touching only the inside of cover all and avoid contact with the skin or scrub. You need to use it or you need to roll down the cover all and you, you need to use or uh, uh, with technique inside out and also try to touch only the inside cover all and avoid to touch the skin or the scrub and after that you need to dispose the gown or the cover all in designated uh, leak proof uh, bag and also you need to disinfect the inner gloves again. Number six, while leaning forward, gently remove the face shield by gripping sides and falling away to discard and disinfect the inner uh, gloves. Number uh, seven, remove the mask by grasping the outer surface uh, uh, with one hand and other hand to pull the strip away and you need also again to disinfect the inner uh, gloves. Number eight, remove and discard gloves you should be take a care to you will not or uh, don't uh, contaminate bar hands during uh, the removal uh, uh, process 
here we want to mention for the first step of the dolphin personal protective equipment, you need to disinfect the outer uh, uh, gloves. But after that, from steps number two until steps uh, uh, number seven, you need to uh, disinfect uh, the inner gloves after each removing of personal protective equipment. Number nine, after you remove all the personal protective uh, equipment, you need to do or perform the hand hygiene. Environmental and waste management, pyloviruses can survive in liquid or dried material for many days. They are inactivated by gamma irradiation, heating for 60 minutes at 60 degree, or boiling for five minutes. And they are sensitive to lipid, solvent, sodium hydrochloride, and other disinfectant. Freezing or refrigeration does not inactivate filovirus. Diligent environmental cleaning and disinfectant and safe handling of potential contaminated material are paramount. Healthcare worker performing environmental cleaning and disinfection should wear recommended personal protective equipment that we mentioned uh, above and also he should be followed. Recommended personal protective equipment uh, steps for the donning and uh, doffing and also he can be used or consider uh, the use of additional barrier uh, uh, like shoes and leg uh, covering and also face protection as face shield or face mask with goggles should be worn when the performing tasks such as liquid waste disposal that can be generate splashes also, the environmental surfaces and equipment should be disinfected by using above intermediate level disinfectants. That means you, know, you need to use first uh, above uh, disinfectant by Ministry of Health and also it should be intermediate level disinfectant. You need also to follow the standard procedure as Ministry of Health policy and manufacturing instruction for the cleaning and disinfection of the environmental surfaces and equipment by using the approved intermediate level disinfectant and also for the textile and laundry and also for the food utensils and dishware. You can visit the uh, GDIPC website and you will find all the guidelines for the uh, environmental for the cleaning and disinfection. Routine cleaning of the personal protective equipment doffing area should be performed at least one per day. That means it should be at least one uh, per day. And also it should be after the doffing of the glossary contaminated personal protective uh, equipment. Ebola and Merburg associated waste management should be uh, placed in double leak proof bag and should be stored in rich leak proof container and also uh, safe contaminated and backing of the waste should be performed as close as possible to the point of generation. The staff should be avoid opening containers or manipulating the waste and also it should be used the personal protective equipment for handling waste until performing the on-site inactivation or transporting the waste away to the off-site inactivation area. The healthcare worker should be immediately spray or wipe the outside surfaces of double bag waste with an approved Ministry of Health disinfectant before removing the waste from the room. That means if you collect the waste uh, uh, and you put it already in double bag leak proof and uh, double uh, leak proof bag, you need uh, to spray or wipe with uh, approved Ministry of Health disinfectant before you remove it uh, uh, from the patient uh, room. The duration of infection control precaution. The duration of precaution should be determined on case by case basis. And also there is some uh, uh, factor that should be considered. Number one, the presence of symptoms number two, the date of symptom resolved, and number three, other condition that would require specific precautions, as uh, example, tuberculosis, uh, C. diff, and available of the laboratory information. Now we will talk about the management of the D cases. Uh, 
uh, only trained person he will handling body of person who has died from Ebola or Nearborn and also when uh, handling the body of the person who has died from the Ebola or Nearborn do not wash uh, uh, or clean the body do not perform any autospy unless it is necessary and also do not remove any inserted medical equipment from the body such as intravenous lines, uh, cannula, endotracheal tube or any implanted electronic medical devices. Healthcare worker dealing with the body should wear all personal protective uh, equipment that we mentioned uh, before and also the body of the suspected or confirmed cases must be placed in double body bag. Uh, you need to place the body in the first bag and after that you need to wipe over the surface of the first body bag using hospital approved disinfectant and seal it. After that you need to place the body in the second body bag and you need to wipe again over the surfaces of the second bag or the second body bag using hospital approved disinfectant and seal it. You need after that to label with the indication of highly infectious material and immediately move the body to the mercury or to the cemetery. Now we will talk about the specification of body bags. We mentioned before in the management of D cases that we need to use a, a double uh, body bag. Here we mention the specification of the body bags. First, it is impeccable, benign, minimum thickness 400 micron, and also should be able to hold 100 to 125 kilos, and also at least uh, have four handles uh, in the body bag to allow safe uh, hand carry and also provide full containment of blood-borne pathogens. Transport the body bag to the cemetery. When we want to transfer or transport the body bag to the cemetery, we need to wear gloves to transport the body bag to the ambulance that will serve. And also transport the body bag should be by two or four person it is depend on the weight of the body and also the body bag is placed uh, on the platform of the car that will serve and usually the head towards on the front the body bag should be gently placed on the car that will serve and also no family member should be sit in the car cabinet it's not allowed to uh, uh, for the family to they will be uh, sit in the uh, car or the ambulance that will be transport the body bag and also the ambulance used for the uh, transport the body bag it's need to be clean and disinfected after uh, they will be uh, transfer uh, the body bag here we mention uh, there is no need to you will have specific or dedicated ambulance for the transport any case or any uh, body bag uh, uh, for the suspected or confirmed uh, Ebola uh, virus only you need to be take care for the cleaning and disinfection for the uh, ambulance you need to follow the correct uh, uh, guidelines for cleaning and disinfection and you need to use the approved ministry of health disinfectant Placement of body bag into the graves. Manually carry the body bag to the grave by the carriers wearing gloves. They should be wear the gloves and also use the handles included in the body bag. Slowly lower the body bag into the grave with individuals wearing gloves who step into the graves and at the end place the body bag into the grave. Place gloves in an infectious waste bag for dispose in correct way. Organize the incineration of the single-use uh, disposable equipment at the hospital or in another designated place for burning this type of equipment and the car used for the transfer uh, the body bag. It need to be clean and disinfected. Now we will talk about the laboratory sample. We will talk about the shipment and packing. 
Sample should be packaged and shipped as infectious substance. Triple pack uh, for all spacemen. Spacemen for shipment should be packaged following the triple packing system, which should be half poured with absorbent material in a watertight, leak proof secondary container and an outer red shipping package. And also each spacement it should be in leak proof primary container, leak proof secondary container, and red outer packaging. If spacement is liquid, place an absorbent material between the primary and secondary container. Place a list of content and paperwork between the secondary and uh, the outer packaging. You need to put the paper uh, work and list of uh, contents between the secondary container and the outer packaging. You need to label outer uh, packaging with infectious substance, shipper and consignee identification, and as name, address, and telephone, and also packet orientation if primary container exceeded 50 ml or more. In this slide, you can see this picture that explain for us how the triple packing here the water primary plastic and the infectious substance. After that, you see the absorbent packing material if it is liquid, as we mentioned before. And also after that, you can see the watertight secondary packing and the list of content and rich outer packing and the infectious label or uh, infectious substance label and also the proper shipping name, address, and telephone. And this is how they will be transport the uh, laboratory sample. For more information, please you can uh, read the guideline for prevention and control of Ebola and Marburg viruses, and you can uh, uh, check this uh, link for the CDC for more information. So, if you have uh, um, further um, clarification, uh, you can contact us at any time. Uh, through the WhatsApp or, or sending email for us or direct contact through the mobile if you need any, um, uh, any uh, support uh, recommendation or answer for any further concern. And if you need further um, references, you can find that our references in the listed uh, presentation. And also you can find a further guideline in the GDIBC website uh, for any further question. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for attending this lecture, and uh, I hope that you gain something from this uh, session or workshop. And if you have any question, please don't hesitate to contact us through um, the, uh, any uh, portal of communication. Thank you so much.